Hello everyone and welcome once again to the Laurel and Hardy blogcast. I'm Patrick Vasey, the author of the Laurel and Hardy blog, and in this second episode we're going to be looking at not one but two films in the Laurel and Hardy canon. Gee, that's tough, is it? Sure is. Oh, don't you worry, I'm quite sure it'll be all right. <laughs> and those films are 45 Minutes from Hollywood from 1926 and Duck Soup from 1927, being Stan and Babe's second and third appearances together on film. But first, I wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who've been in touch following the first episode. I've received some great feedback so far, which has been brilliant and really encouraging to me. Um, thank you particularly to Billy Wiz, who left me a great review on Apple Podcasts. Um, and that sort of thing really does make a difference because it just ensures that the podcast gets noticed by more people online. Um, if you haven't checked out episode one yet, I'd really encourage you to do that. Um, number one, you will have missed a terrific interview with Laurel and Hardy historian and author Rob Stone. Um, and just as this podcast series follows my written blog, uh, we're following the film careers of Stan and Babe in chronological order. So in episode one, Rob and I talked about the boys first encounter together, the lucky dog. And so today's episode is focused on the next step of their journey. And to help me to do that, my special guest today is film historian and author Steve Massa, and he'll be joining us in just a few moments. Isn't that swell? So now we come to my favourite part of the podcast, our special guest. Today's guest is Steve Massa. Steve is the author of a number of books, including Slapstick Divas, The Women of Silent Comedy, Lame Brains and Lunatics, The Good, The Bad and The Forgotten of Silent Comedy, and his latest appropriately weighty volume is Rediscovering Roscoe, The Films of Fatty Arbuckle. Steve has also provided essays and commentaries for many DVD and Blu-ray releases, including collections of Fatty Arbuckle, Harry Langdon and Buster Keaton. Uh, aside from his writing, he's organised and curated comedy film programmes for the Museum of Modern Art, the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian Institution and the Pordenone Silent Film Festival. As well as being a huge fan of Laurel and Hardy and with specific relevance to our podcast today, Steve was involved in the recent restoration and presentation of Laurel and Hardy's Duck Soup. So it gives me great pleasure to say, Steve, thank you for joining us and welcome to the Laurel and Hardy blogcast. Oh, thanks, Patrick. It's great to uh, be here. Uh, it's absolutely wonderful to have you. Your um, your sort of history there speaks for itself. I mean, you've you've had a finger in many pies, and I'm sure your name is very familiar to a lot of um, film fans, especially silent film fans. So could I just start by asking you, where did your fascination with comedy, particularly silent comedy, come from? Uh, well, you know, I grew up in a kind of a rural part of Ohio, and uh, we didn't have any art museums. We didn't have any film museums, you know, or... or anything like that but we had television and the, in my home the television was on every day so I was seeing a wide variety of what was you know being shown on television and there were programs that had been uh, made for kids where they took silent comedy shorts and edited them down to maybe about 10 minutes they, they basically made like cartoons out of them um, they took these silent comedies they took out all the title cards they would put funny narration or funny music. Um, and then they, I was watching these every day and I got really hooked. I really loved them. And of course there was no information. I didn't know who was who or, or anything like that. But I did start recognizing people. Uh, I remember seeing Harry Langdon, uh, a ton of fun, a uh, number of people. And, you know, I would recognize them from film to film and start following their adventures. And that's initially how I, I got turned on to silent comedy, that I really got hooked because I just loved it. I love the gags and I started recognizing routines. You know, you'd see someone go in a restaurant with oysters, with a oyster in the oyster stew, and then you'd see somebody else do it. And you'd see, you know, that kind of that silent comedy universe where everybody is to that same vocabulary. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and so how does that relate to your Laurel and Hardy backstory? Where, can you, do you have any sort of earliest memories of Laurel and Hardy or how you got into um, well, Laurel it, and Hardy? Well, it really was happening at the same time that I, again, it was through television because Laurel and Hardy sound shorts were extremely popular. This would be 1958, 59, early 1960s, and they were very big on American television, the sound shorts. 
Uh, so I, again, I was watching them every day. I was watching the Little Rascals and the Three Stooges, but Laurel and Hardy were my particular favorites. And Stan Laurel was my favorite comedian. And for, for a number of years, I, I was an actor actually in New York for about 25 years. And Stan was always kind of my inspiration to, you know, to act and to be, be a comedian as I was for a while. But I was always interested in the films and the whole history. And uh, so I was watching all these things and I was really obsessed. And uh, I have a story very similar to Rob Stone's in the previous podcast where I went in some kind of store and there was a paperback book rack and there was the yellow book with Laurel and Hardy on it. And it was John McCabe's Mr. Laurel and Mr. Hardy. So that was the first film book that I ever bought which was quickly followed by the films of Laurel and Hardy by William K. Everson. So I had those two books, which I inhaled, you know, because <laughs> they were, and especially um, the McCabe book, I was a little young for the, for all of it, but I was reading parts of it, but the films of Laurel and Hardy was really uh, yeah. like a Bible for me yeah. at the time. Yeah. Very visual, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, a fabulous book. So, um, and you know, obviously, you, I mentioned uh, you know you're very um, involved with events, you know, and putting on festivals and film festivals. Is there much demand or interest in old silent comedies today? Uh yeah. I mean, Ben Modell and I have been doing our silent comedy film series, or, or I'm sorry, yeah, silent clowns film series for 23 years, and we do a screening a month, so it's it's sort of New York's longest running continuous film festival. You know, we do it once a month and uh, it's more popular than ever. We're doing very well with that. And uh, the programs that we've done at the Museum of Modern Art have been very popular. So there, I think there really still is a, is a great interest. And our mission is to try and reach the younger audiences. Uh, by that, I mean under 40. Yeah. But even children too, because, you know, we want to try and keep the interest going you know, through the next generations. But they seem, um, they seem very open and, and really embrace the films. And what I, what I really wanted to ask you particularly, Steve, as well, obviously when, we, uh, when you hear any discussion or read any discussions about silent comedy, the conversation usually drifts towards the, the big three, Chaplin, Keaton and Lloyd. And I know obviously you're doing your best to make the big four with, with uh, Fatih Arbuckle, and, and rightly so. But very rarely do do I see or hear Laurel and Hardy mentioned in that same kind of um, group. And obviously, I'm, I'm aware that there was a bit of a time difference with Laurel and Hardy coming to the to the films. But how do you think Laurel and Hardy's silence compare to the, the likes of Lloyd and Chaplin and and? Kim? Oh, I I think they're right up there. Things like Big Business, and you know, they're they're once they joined and really kind of got their groove going. Um, I think they're right up there. I think they're the last real peak of silent comedy, you know, before sound films come in. And, and a lot of that was happening at the Roach studio. The Max Davidson films are really wonderful. Uh, unfortunately, those late silent Charlie Chase films, for the most part, aren't available. But what he was doing in 26, 27 was a real peak as well. But I, I think the Laurel, Laurel and Hardy are right there. And actually they're sort of the transition to sound comedy because they already slowed down the pace. They slowed down the pace and, and it's that back and forth reaction and tit for tat kind of thing, um, which I think is why they had such an easy time just moving right into sound films without missing a beat. Yeah, it's almost as if they kind of knew it was coming in a way, and and as you say, know, slowed it, it down yeah. in readiness. Yeah, absolutely, it's a good point. And some of some of that was they're working with Leo McCary because I think McCary kind of had that idea of slowing things down a little bit and and people taking turns back and forth doing things is kind of interesting. Um, but it was almost like they knew what was coming. You don't believe me? Yes, I don't believe. What do you mean you don't believe me? Now, don't worry, we'll be hearing more from Steve very shortly as he discusses today's first film under the spotlight with me. And that film, of course, is 45 Minutes from Hollywood, filmed December 1925 through April 6th, 1926. 
Release date, December 26, 1926. It's a two-reeler produced by Hal Roach, directed by Fred Gill, with titles by H.M. Walker. The main cast were Glenn Tryon, Charlotte Mino and Rube Clifford, with appearances, among others, by Stan Laurel, Oliver Hardy, Thader Barra and our gang. After The Lucky Dog, it was another five years before Stan and Babe appeared again in front of the cameras together. In the intervening years, though, neither comedian was idle. Needing a source of income, Stan initially went back to vaudeville, until meeting up again with Bronco Billy Anderson and agreeing to film a series of eight comedies for amalgamated pictures that Anderson could attempt to sell as a job lot. Stan left the vaudeville stages behind him for the last time, and in early 1922 decided to settle down in Los Angeles and pursue a full-time career in the movie business. Anderson's publicity drive promoting Stan and the series soon swung into action, as illustrated by this article from Motion Picture News, May 6th, 1922. Headline. Anderson has comedian. Stan Laurel, who came to America with Chaplin, is latest star. A new English comedian is shortly to be introduced on the screen by Amalgamated Producing Company of Los Angeles, according to the announcement made by G.M. Anderson, the head of this new organisation producing on the West Coast. The comedian is Stan Laurel, known for his work in various vaudeville engagements. In Stan Laurel, I believe I have found a comedian who will prove as popular as Chaplin, Anderson said in speaking of his new comedies. He is not an imitator of Chaplin, but is a graduate of the same school of experience as Chaplin. In fact, Laurel came to America with the same company of players as Chaplin, and for a number of seasons played with the same Fred Carnot's knight in an English music hall troupe. This comedian, new in films, has an exceptional sense of humour and individuality, and personality that registers on the screen, and will bring into film comedies mannerisms of Welshmen and Scotchmen so common in London. Laurel is a pantomimist of exceptional ability, and in the three pictures in which he has worked, he has adapted his technique to film possibilities in a manner that makes me believe his success is assured. The pictures Stan made with Anderson were successful enough to finally make his name and give him a reputation as a noteworthy star. Once the series was complete, he moved on for a first stint as a contracted player in one reel comedies at the Hal Roach Studios, signing on the dotted line in early 1923 as reported in Camera, February 10th, 1923. Stan Laurel has signed a contract with Hal Roach and will soon begin work on his initial picture, which will be a travesty on Under Two Flags. May Laurel, his wife, will play the leading feminine role. Author Rob Stone, in his groundbreaking book, Laurel or Hardy, informs us that Laurel's contract was for a term of five years and that he was to receive 12.5% of the revenue of his films. Stan's experience at the Roach Lot appears to have been mostly positive. He was quickly promoted from one to two real comedies. He met and began working alongside many of the team that would soon become his close friends and regular co-stars. And the 25 or so films he made there further enhanced his reputation within the industry as a leading comic. And yet, he didn't see out the contracted five years. The commonly accepted reason for Stan's departure from Roach is presented by his official biographer, John McCabe. The story blames Stan's vaudeville partner and common-law wife May as being too troublesome, always demanding prominent roles in Stan's pictures and berating Stan for performing with other actresses. Hal Roach understandably saw this as too much hassle and released him out of the contract after only 12 months or so. Although the situation, for want of a better word, with the problematic May appears to have been affecting Laurel's reputation, he did manage to land a new five-year contract with producer Joe Rock. Between February and September 1924, Stan made a dozen films under his new contract, and Rock even managed to convince May to leave Stan alone and return to her native Australia. Joe Rock, it seems, was a pretty clever businessman. He'd negotiated 12 months' worth of funding, during which time he was to make and release 12 Stan Laurel comedies. The canny producer had his team complete the whole series in just seven months, scheduled the release dates across the year, thus enabling him to sit back whilst banking the remaining five months' worth of funding. Stan had been paid for his work, but now had to face the next five months with no work and subsequently no more pay coming in. This situation was resolved when Warren Doan, a general manager at the Hal Roach Studios, called Stan and offered him the chance to come back to Roach to work as a writer and a gagman. Joe Rock agreed to this under the condition that Laurel remained behind the camera, lest his funders find out that the Rock-Laurel comedies were already in the can and pull the remainder of his funding. Between The Lucky Dog and 45 Minutes from Hollywood, both Stan and Babe appeared in around 50 films, 
and Stan, supported and encouraged by Doan, and whilst under the wing of a roach director named F. Richard Jones, began making a name for himself behind the camera by writing and directing shorts with other comedians, with some considerable success. So, by 1925, both Stan and Babe were under individual contracts at the Hal Roach Studios. Babe's first film at Roach, Wild Papa, was released in May 1925, and from then, as Ted Okuda and James L. Nyber point out, he was used with increasing frequency on the lot. However, he wasn't put under a long-term contract at the studio until the middle of the following year, as announced in Motion Picture News, June 19th, 1926. Headline. Roach signs Babe Hardy for Pathé Comedies. Oliver Norvell Hardy, more generally known as Babe Hardy, has been signed by Hal Roach for a long-term appearance in two real comedies for Pathé release. He will play various types of supporting roles in Charlie Chase and Mabel Normand comedies, and featured parts in the series of All-Star 2 reelers. His latest appearance was in the Glen Tryon comedy Along Came Auntie. Given the amount of films that were being churned out at the Roach Studios at that time, it could be strongly argued that it was inevitable the boys would cross paths eventually. And cross paths they surely did, although during the five years post The Lucky Dog, the boys were only involved in three other film projects together, Ollie acting and Stan directing. The picture that holds a somewhat pivotal role in Laurel and Hardy history, and certainly in Laurel and Hardy lore, is a two-reeler called Get Em Young from 1926. This was the film that finally fetched Stan out from behind the camera and thrust him back into the spotlight. Stan was one of the picture's principal writers and was also due to direct, and Babe was cast to play the role of a butler. During the weekend, prior to the start of shooting, however, Babe sustained third-degree burns to his arm in a cooking accident, and was unable to take part in the film. Stan was instructed to take his place, and so Mr Laurel became an actor once more. Here's Stan from a 1959 interview, telling it in his own words. A lady came down to the Hal Roach studio, where I was now writing, directing, and gang men capacity. So I was making a picture with uh, Clyde Cook, and, uh, and Babe got into stock at the studio. We had a little stock company there. So I used Babe many times in whatever picture that I was making. And finally, we were ready to go uh, on a picture on the Monday, and on the Friday before, Babe burned his arm pretty bad. He used to love to cook at home. This afternoon he was cooking the roast of lamb and the pan fell out of the oven and the hot grease burned his up. So he wasn't able to to uh, go into the picture on the Monday. So at the last minute, Roach says, well, you better go in. He couldn't find anybody to play it. So at the last minute, I went in and played it all uh, my idea of it. Of course, it had to be changed from the way hard it looked <laughs> Anyway, Roach liked it, the preview, and says, keep yourself in for the next one. In August of 1926, Stan and Babe were finally cast to appear in the same film together once again. This time, however, unlike The Lucky Dog, this new film, entitled 45 Minutes from Hollywood, was not a Stan Laurel comedy, but had an actor named Glenn Tryon in the lead role. Tryon was being championed by Hal Roach in the hopes that he would one day take the place of his old star, Harold Lloyd, who had left Roach in 1924 to produce his own pictures. Unfortunately for Roach, Tryon's celebrity star didn't quite hit the heights that they'd hoped, but at least his films did provide an opportunity to bring Roach's two future megastars together, even if they were only used as supporting players. Stan had a very minor blink-and-you'll-miss-him type role in the picture, playing a hotel guest and looking fairly unrecognisable with a nightcap and a huge bushy moustache. Babe, on the other hand, also sporting equally bushy facial hair, had a larger part to play as a hotel detective, who spent most of his scenes in a state of undress with only a shower curtain wrapped around him to preserve his modesty. There was actually a good and quite interesting reason for Stan to be hiding behind a huge moustache, for hiding he was. The reason for this was simply that he was still under contract with producer Joe Rock, and for legal reasons he wasn't allowed to appear in front of the camera until his contract was up, hence the disguise. As mentioned above, Rock had been happy for Stan to work for Roach behind the cameras, writing and directing, but for whatever reason, Stan found himself back in the frame. It was risky, and Laurel and Rock ended up suing each other, even though they had been and continued afterwards to be very good friends. Despite both Stan and Babe appearing in another film together, the boys weren't cast as a team, far from it. In actual fact, they don't even share a scene, being kept apart by a bedroom door. The film was a Hal Roach all-stars comedy, 
and as such it features very small cameos by other stars from the studio, such as Theda Barra, Our Gang, and there's even a quick glimpse of Laurel and Hardy regular Tiny Sanford as a railway guard towards the start. The basic premise is that Glenn Tryon's character travels to Hollywood to pay a bill. Whilst in town, Tryon spots what he thinks is a movie about a bank robbery being filmed, but it's actually a cover for a real bank robbery. Tryon approaches a lady from the film, who turns out to be a bank robber in drag, and the pair get chased down the street by the police. They run into a hotel to hide out, and there follows a number of scenes of cross-dressing mix-ups and plenty of running up and down frantically. Babe Hardy's appearance is very welcome as the hotel detective and adds an undeniable quality sadly lacking from the film up until this point. On the whole, it's a pretty forgettable affair. As Randy Skretvet accurately puts it, 45 minutes from Hollywood is interesting for about 45 seconds. There are a few funny moments from the boys, especially Ollie's reaction to his jealous wife, and also the scene where a cat runs up his curtain towel thing in the hotel lobby. It's certainly good for a laugh or two. It's the kind of film you revisit once in a blue moon for posterity's sake, but then you quickly realise why you haven't had it on regular rotation. It's nice to see it now and again, but I have to admit, it's not a film I'll be watching again in a hurry. So those are my thoughts on today's first featured film. Uh, Now let's return to our interview and see what our special guest, Steve Massa, makes of it. If we start off with 45 Minutes from Hollywood, uh, as I said, filmed uh, December 1925. Now, this is not a Laurel and Hardy comedy. It's not even a Stan Laurel solo comedy. And for my money, if it wasn't for Stan and Babe's appearances, albeit brief... I probably wouldn't be giving that film a second glance um, if I'm going to be completely <laughs> blunt. Um, so I'd love to hear your expert view from it uh, of it uh, because it's a, a Glenn Tryon uh, film. Yeah it's, yeah, it's definitely a Glenn Tryon film. And his career is kind of interesting because he he came to the studio around 1923 and he's doing small parts. He's in a few of the Stan Laurel solo films. Uh, he's in Smithy. Uh, he's in, he's very good in the Soilers because there's the big fight at the end with uh, Jimmy Finless and, and Stan and Glenn Tryon is the effeminate cowboy that keeps interrupting oh, their fight right. and coming in and out. And I yes. think that's the funniest he's ever, that he would ever be. He's absolutely hysterical. Yeah. Well, he's kind of made up. He's got like a little, like a five o'clock shadow and all that, but that's, that's him. But not long after that, Harold Lloyd left the studio to go out on his own, produce his own films, and Hal Roach kind of seized upon Glenn Tryon to kind of fill that niche. Um, And he right away put uh, Tryon in a couple of features that had kind of been developing for Harold. One is called, uh, one was the Battling Orioles, and the other one was the White Sheep. Uh, so he was kind of working his way in small roles and then all of a sudden he got, you know, became the star. He did these two features and then they put him in this series of which 45 minutes, you know, from Hollywood is in. Um, and, uh, you know, I think today he doesn't get a lot of, uh, people don't respond <laughs> that well to, I mean, he can be very funny and there's certain uh, uh, films of that series that are really, you know, very strong, but 45 minutes from Hollywood's not particularly... It's not one of them. <laughs> no, it's not one of them. It's not just me, okay. It has some interesting things in it, uh, you know, the ho- whole Hollywood premise and, you know, the tour bus when the, and you see the clip of Theta Barra and you see this and, and you know, so that's kind of uh, that's kind of fun. And, and, and Babe is doing his usual kind of uh heavy at that time you know he was doing that in a lot of the roach things uh where he's kind of the heavy you know kind of a holdover from his days with larry seaman and billy west he's always off got a big mustache and this he has the kind of wild hair as well that's it but i think i mean i think babe's part is I mean, I guess I'm I'm very biased, of course, but when Babe comes into it, you think, oh, okay, we've got a bit of quality, and you well, can just the the quality of his acting comes he, through straight away. He's a natural. He yeah. was a natural, and the camera loved him. So anything he did, it read immediately. I mean, it read so well. I mean, he's just a natural film actor. I mean, he didn't have the stage years on stage like Stan or Chaplin or Keaton. You know, he came to films 
doing, you know, working for Lubin in 1915 and, or 1914. And he's just natural. He's a natural film actor, even from the get-go when you see some of the earliest stuff. So, yeah, I mean, he just takes control when he, you know, when he finally arrives in the film. Um, and, you know, because the whole beginning has all that family stuff on the farm with Grandpa, with the Rube Clifford, who's not <laughs> very funny. And um, <laughs> I guess that was his shtick. He did this kind of Rube shtick. And he, he's actually much younger. He's all made up. Uh, that's why he can do all that physical gags, because he's really a younger man. Um, but uh, once Stan, or once Babe shows up, you know, it really makes a big difference. And there are other people too. You see Jerry Mandy is the guy burning the trash. Uh, and there's some other of the Roach character people that are, you know, that are doing little bits. Yeah. Yeah. And I only, and I only just realized this last, uh, the last time I viewed it, um, there's actually a very quick glimpse of the, is it the alley uh, from Liberty where they're changing the trousers? Oh, right. Um, it must have been near the studio, probably. And know, just somewhere. round, yeah, and just round the corner. I know yeah. John Bankston's, I think, has written a great piece on Liberty and that whole area, the, that and that alleyway specifically. Um, yeah. And also, they run past like the windows where the the boys climb out of in, in We Fall Down. Um, so, and I didn't haven't noticed it before, but suddenly I realised that you know it's that same those same little locations popping up again. Um, and then there, of course, is Stan's appearance. Yes. In the- it's like, well, Jimmy Finlayson wasn't available, that, you know, because he's made up like Finlayson. Well, I've re- and I've read that. I've read that he was possibly going to be Jimmy Finlayson, I think, or whether that's just because of the moustache. But uh... Well, the, the, the issue is Stan was still on contract as a performer to Joe Rock. And he had, he had done that whole series of comedies for Joe Rock. And the way they did those States' Rights series is they made a whole bunch of them. They like did them all up front and then they would distribute them. Well, Stan had already been paid. So he wasn't getting any more money, but he was still on contract. So he couldn't appear as a performer. And that's why he's working at Roach as a writer and director. Um, so I think when they appear, they, they were basically disguising him, you know, with the yeah. big mustache and yeah. he's got the uh, kind of eye makeup and the, um, the cap, you know, the sleeping cap. I think that was a way to disguise him. And it didn't work because apparently he got sued by Joe Rock. Well, yeah, <laughs> I think that was because of, um, oh, the later film, you know, the one where Babe burned his arm and then Stan took over the yeah. role. Get him yeah. young. Oh, right. I, right. Think, okay. I think because I read somewhere that Stan had trepidations of doing it because of the Joe Rock contract. And Roach just said, do it. We'll take care of it. And then Rock did sue. And then Roach countersued and froze Joe Rock's assets. So Rock eventually dropped the suit because he couldn't do any, you know, he couldn't produce. Right. So. Okay. <clears throat> that, that answers some questions because I was going to say, I mean, I've been listening to some of Stan's um, interviews from like the 50s, late 50s. And he was sort of saying that, you know, he didn't think much of himself as a solo comedian. Um, and he was quite happy to be behind the camera, be yeah. directing. And in fact, he was getting sort of nudges from the studio saying, you know, you're good at this. This is what you should be doing. So I was just wondering why take the risk for that small bit of, you know, you know, was he yeah, getting I don't understand cold feet? Either. He just wanted to get back in front of the camera. He didn't sound like he wanted to be in front of the camera. It was odd. No, and he had, uh, was F. Richard Jones, who was kind of being his mentor behind the camera, you know, really encouraging him to write and direct. But that would make sense then if it was the... Um, Kind of the, the the film where, as you say, Babe's burnt his arm. Um, yeah, then get him is, young. Is it, yeah, it's, so it's a bit of a back against the wall, and Roach is saying, "No, come on, you get in front of the cameras of things." That that makes so, more yeah, sense. Yeah, otherwise, get it. And I think Babe burned his arm the night before, and they were supposed to start shooting. So you know, they didn't want to hold up production. Yeah, I think he said he, he burnt it on the Friday, and they're shooting on the Monday, so he had you yeah. know, his third degree burns on it. Yeah, absolutely. So interesting. That's great. Okay, brilliant. So overall, your opinion is it's not such a brilliant film. You know, it doesn't as a as a silent film, it doesn't really stack up that well against you know other silent films of its. No, it's not. It's not big business. It's not um, past the gravy. It's uh, it's enjoyable, and there's some funny bits in it. It's not you know it's not even the best of the Glenn Tryon series as we mentioned before. I you know I want to be too rough, but it's kind of a run of the mill kind of roach product of that time, yeah. 
Are you going to stand for that? Say, listen. If he'd have said one more word to me, I would have... <laughs> oh. So that's it for part one of today's episode. I think it's probably a good time for a short musical interlude. And so we come to our second film under focus today, which is Duck Soup. Um, and just before I get into the blog part of Duck Soup, um, I was contacted fairly recently on the blog's website by Jeff. Jeff is one of our uh, latest blogheads out there in the community. Um, hello, Jeff, if you're listening. Um, and Jeff was just asking the question, why is it called Duck Soup? And I had to think to myself, you know, I have no idea. I have no idea why it's called Duck Soup. Um, and fortunately, to the rescue came Robin, another one of our blogheads. Uh, and Robin's answer was actually quite interesting to me, and so I thought I'd share it. Um, and Robin says, one reason why it's called Duck Soup is because Hardy says, in one of the original subtitles, Duck Soup, my good hives, were in clover for 48 hours just after they realise they've got the house to themselves. Duck soup apparently was a slang expression in the early part of the 20th century, which meant as good as done, easy as pie, or it's a piece of cake, which means it's something easy to do or accomplish. So that's, um, yeah, that was new to me. So um, hopefully it might be new to some of you as well. Anyway, we'll crack on. Uh, well, Duck Soup filmed September 20th through October 2nd, 1926, uh, with a release date of March 13th, 1927. It was a two-reeler, produced by Hal Roach, directed by Fred Gill, with titles by H.M. Walker. The main cast, of course, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, with Madeleine Herlock, William Austin and James A. Marcus. Widely thought of as the first Laurel and Hardy film, Duck Soup was based on a sketch entitled Home from the Honeymoon, written in 1905 by Stan's father, Arthur J. Jefferson. As well as a playwright, A.J. Jefferson was also a theatre manager of some repute, and following a dispute with one of the comics appearing in Home from the Honeymoon, Jefferson replaced the actor with his own son, Stanley. Fast forward another 20 years or so, and Stanley Jefferson, now going under the name Stan Laurel, and employed at the Hal Roach Studios, rewrites his father's sketch and includes himself in the cast. The story must have appealed to Stan greatly as he used it three times during his film career. First as Duck Soup, then three years later it was recycled for the sound short Another Fine Mess, and finally Stan reused the opening sequence on the park bench for their 1932 feature-length outing, Pack Up Your Troubles. Interestingly, these Laurel and Hardy films appear not to be the only cinematic adaptations of A.J. Jefferson's sketch. Glenn Mitchell, writing in the Laurel and Hardy magazine, reports on the discovery of an Austrian film, dating back to 1913, much earlier than Duck Soup, starring a duo called Cockle and Seth. In his article, Mitchell illustrates the close similarities between the plot of this early film, um, which translates to Cockle as Landlord, and goes on to suggest that this was likely an unauthorised adaptation of A.J.'s sketch. An English-language print of the film is known to exist, but whether A.J. and Stan were aware of the film's existence is not known. Either way, it appears that Cockle and Seth were the first to adapt the sketch for the big screen. As for Stan's adaptation, the film opens with a brief scene showing Colonel Blood, played by James A. Marcus, preparing to leave town to begin a big hunting vacation. His aged butler, played by William Courtright, who you may remember as Ollie's Uncle Bernal in the hilarious short That's My Wife, is attempting to help him, but proceeds to do quite the opposite and drives the colonel to distraction. Uh, the film cuts to a quiet bench filmed at Westlake Park, and we're introduced to Stan and Babe, under their characters as Marmaduke Maltravers, Hardy, and James Hives, Laurel. The two vagrants minding their own business, Babe is earnestly attempting to read the newspaper while Stan is convulsed with laughter at the comic strips or the funnies, much to Hardy's annoyance. An article in Hardy's newspaper reveals that vagrants are being drafted to help fight forest fires that are currently ablaze and out of control. Of course, Stan and Babe are soon accosted by the forest rangers, and rather than being drafted, the boys make a swift and comical exit, first on foot and then by stealing a bicycle. There were two bikes, you may notice, propped up on the curb, but they thought it best just to share one. <laughs> uh, and they were chased closely, of course, by the rangers. 
They give their pursuers the slip and hide out in a large palatial house where some French doors have been left open. This is the house of Colonel Blood, who has since departed on his vacation and whose butler and maid are also just leaving to sneak a few days away for themselves. From their hiding positions, the boys overhear that the house is to be empty for a few days, and so they come out of hiding and begin to settle into their new short-term lodgings, beginning with a huge slap-up meal. All the while, the rangers are still sniffing around outside, trying to discover where the cowardly vagrants have fled to. Before long, the doorbell rings as Lord and Lady Tarbotham, William Austin and Madeleine Herlock have come to inquire about renting the property. In the 1930 remake, the Tarbotham characters are rewritten as Lord and Lady Plumtree, with Charles Gerard and Thelma Todd ably and memorably inhabiting the roles. The remainder of the film is a bit of an old-school farce, with Stan dressing up as Agnes the Maid and Babe attempting to pass himself off as the master of the house, Colonel Blood. The prospective tenants have never seen Blood or his maid before, and so the charade goes swimmingly, until the real Colonel Blood returns, that is, unexpectedly early, and all hell breaks loose. James A. Marcus has a worryingly dangerous and unhinged air about him, much more terrifying than his 1930 counterpart James Finlayson, who takes over the part as Colonel Buckshot. Finlayson would of course play the part much more humorously as anyone would expect, but Marcus's Colonel Blood was much more convincing as someone you wouldn't want to cross. <laughs> this is enjoyable stuff to watch, as well as being very interesting from a historical point of view of the boy's character development. Some decent laughs here and there, and Stan's performance in drag as Agnes the Maid is great. Although, I have to say, reprised uh, in the role for another fine mess, I think is arguably better, as the ability for Stan to play with dialogue opposite Thelma Todd adds a lot more depth to the characterisation. The film's reception appears to have been fairly positive, if this review from Moving Picture World, April 2nd, 1927, is anything to go by. Duck soup, pathé, two reels. Two tramps certainly managed to fall in soft in this Hal Roach comedy. Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy appear in these roles. It's an amusing comedy with quite a lot of laughable situations, several of which are of a familiar type, but cleverly handled. As the result of all this, there is a lot of complications that will evoke laughter from the majority of patrons. Duck Soup is the first time we see the boys working together as a team, and from all appearances their on-screen characters are pretty much fully formed in this film. Okay, so there's, there's still quite a lot missing, such as Ollie's Darby, his little moustache, his tie twiddling, and Stan's trademark head scratching and crying, etc, etc. And if you can ignore the vagrant costumes, you've got to look at this film and think, well, that's it. Surely after this, the producers, the directors at the studio, they must have realised what quality they'd got on their hands, and immediately started to sculpt them into a cinematic golden partnership, right? You could be forgiven for thinking that every one of the boys' films from here on in would build on the solid foundation blocks of Duck Soup, and the team as we know it would start to gain some traction. Well, sadly that wasn't the case. There was frustratingly still a further five films of the boys playing random separate parts before Stan and Ollie got the chance to be a team once more. But when that did eventually happen, there was no going back. Sadly, the quality of exist existing prints of Duck Soup has been pretty poor, uh, therefore one's enjoyment of it has arguably been slightly hindered. Uh, however, there was some good news very recently published on social media by Randy Scretvet, um, citing our good friend Steve Massa, and I'll be quizzing Steve about that very shortly, so um, stay tuned for that. For more information on Duck Soup, I just want to recommend two different sources of information, actually, which are fairly recent, so you may not have come across them yet. Uh, the first is John Bengston's silentlocations.com. Uh, he's written a blog entitled How Laurel and Hardy Film Duck Soup, and that's well worth a look, um, because obviously, as John usually does, he shows you all the locations where the filming took place. Um, so have a look at that. That's silentlocations.com. Uh, you can find a, a link for that in my blog on Duck Soup. Um, and the second place um, I wanted to recommend is Danny Lawrence's latest book, The Making of Laurel and Hardy. In that, Danny skillfully describes the boys' individual careers and their journey up to and including the origins and the making of duck soup. So well recommended. Um, you can find a link direct to Danny's book on the blog and in the show notes as well. So please do give them a look. <laughs> and as promised, here's what Steve had to say about duck soup. So Duck Soup filmed September slash October 1926. Um, and interestingly, I've noticed um, the studio didn't really publicise Stan or Babe as appearing in the film. It was more Madeleine Herlock. Yeah. Um, Who they borrowed from Max Sennett. 
Right. Okay. So yeah, they, she was so on they... contract to Senate, and right. uh, so I'm I'm not sure why they borrowed her, but they must have you know really wanted to um, highlight her in the film. Yeah, because Roger was actually quite big friends with Senate. I think wasn't he? He was supposed. Yeah, they were friends at the time. They they played out like a bit of a a rivals type of thing, but they were actually yeah they were actually quite good friends. So I believe. Yeah. Um, so how, so what are your thoughts on Duck Soup, um, Steve? Overall. Well, I think Duck Soup is really solid. It's a very very good film. Uh, I've seen it a lot recently because of the new restoration, which we showed in Portanone. We had the premiere in October. And it's since been shown at the Museum of Modern Art. It's it's starting to get around. Well, it was starting to get around until all the festivals <laughs> closed up for the meantime. But uh, so, can you tell us I, about how how did that all come about? Then the the, the restoration scene. Well, it's What's very the story interesting. That? Um, my friend Uli Rudell and I were doing a European slapstick program for the Pordenone Silent Film Festival, and we wanted to have a music hall program. One particular program was going to focus on people from the music hall, music hall aspects. And technically it's not a European film, but it's a very, you know, good example of music hall because it is based on the sketch uh, that, that Stan's father, Arthur Jefferson had written, uh, Home from the Honeymoon. And Stanton also was involved in writing the sketch with his father. Uh, so we decided to bend the rules a little bit and show Duck Soup because it had all this, this music hall background and um there's never been a really great print of duck soup available it was considered lost for many years and then uh i think a a french titled i think it was a 16 millimeter print or a 9.5 version turned up uh but again it was kind of choppy there was kind of a lot of material at the beginning missing uh and the titles weren't the original titles uh, but in the meantime, other material had turned up. Uh, the BFI had a, a beautiful 9.5 that was pretty complete. Um, no, actually, I reversed that. BFI had a 35 millimeter British release that had English titles. And Lobster Films had the 9.5 uh, that, that was very complete. And then Library of Congress had the sequence of Madeline Herlock of Stan getting the bath ready for Madeline Herlock. That was in a sensor reel they had of Path A Films. So that whole sequence was in, wasn't in any of the other films, but it was by itself at Library of Congress. And uh, my, I have to say my friend Uli was kind of urging Lobster and these other organizations to put it all together. And I was a little pessimistic thinking, oh, they can't they can't do this in time for October in the festival, but they did. Uh, so they were met, they, they homogenized everything. And it's still a little bit of a work in progress because they're still finding a little bit better material to add to it. But, uh, and it, better in, it, as in quality, the quality of the print or actually. quality of the material. And, and again, a little more that maybe wasn't, I mean, th this restoration was the most complete, than had ever been available. And it looks good. Yeah, it has the whole beginning with the servants, with the, what's his name, Colonel Blood. The, Colonel the, Blood, yeah. Yeah, Colonel Blood. Because that was all often missing, most of with the servants closing up the house and him going off on the hunting expedition. Um, most of that's there. And uh, some of the original titles are, are now part of it too, so. Uh, is there any sort of plans for a Blu-ray release for that, or? I'm sure somewhere down the pike. I don't think they've. It hasn't really been talked uh, about yet. Um, it's probably probably will be through Lobster, I would think, but nothing definite, unfortunately. But it. But seeing this restored version, it's always been a hard film to watch, because it was fragmented. It was in not great copies, but this this restoration really gives you a chance to appreciate the film and kind of really see it. And it's really solid film. And, you know, they're really working together as a team. Yeah. Yeah. I think what stri what strikes me, I, I, what I quite like about it is that it's, it's very Laurel and Hardy, but it's not, it's not kind of constrained by any kind of formula, if you like, it's, it's, you know, it's very much them, 
but they're a bit looser, a bit freer because they don't have to do the head scratch or they don't have to do the tie or twiddle. Have to or, cry. Yeah, you know, it, yeah. it doesn't have to be that way. It can they can just fr- kind of freestyle it almost because they're still playing with things, but it still feels very much a Laurel and Hardy comedy. Yeah, you can really see their teamwork and everything is is really is really there. It's uh, so I think now we can really see that and really appreciate it. And it's a really solid film. It's very funny. And I, I think it compares quite well with Another Fine Mess. What do you think about the, the comparison between the, the later version? I kind of like The Silent a little bit better, although I, you know, Another Fine Mess is a great short. And, of course, it has Finlayson, yeah. who always adds a lot yes. you know, to the proceedings. Uh, the guy who plays Colonel Blood is kind of interesting and it's kind of blustery, you know, that kind of... Uh, but, but Finlayson's more fun. They Agreed. Oh, is nobody going to argue with that one? <laughs> yeah, and Thelma Todd, of course, appears also in another fine mass, adding another element to it. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And Ma- Madeline Herlock is very good, like she is in her Senate. But you know, I'm surprised they didn't. Why they had her come from Senate? Because um, Anita Garvin could have done that role, or you know, well, it has some very good supporting people. Uh, when the moving guy comes, it's Bobby Dunn, who you know, he's a Max Senate regular and he takes some really great falls where they're running around with the trunks. And um, Robert Cortman is the um, park ranger. Yes. You know, the, the park ranger that's trying to, uh, you know, to make them join. And, and his presence is great, you know, because he's, he's always a heavy in these silent comedies. I mean, he played, he was a regular in a lot of William S. Hart films and, and you know, in serious films, but his... You know, he has that that sense of menace, which is great yeah. for these comedies. You know, the scene with he and Stan, where he's kind of he and Stan are kind of flirting. Yeah, Stan's in drag, That's and right. flirting, and then of course Stan loses his skirt. But it's great; they're both very good in that scene. So Cortman adds a lot. Yeah, they play they do play it very well. Um, and also, there's William is it William Court Courtright at the uh, who plays William? Oh Blitz, yeah, William Courtright is the, the butler. butler. Yeah. And Laura Lavarney is the, uh, what is she, the maid. And I think they're a married couple, but that's where her, her wig yeah. fuck comes off. <laughs> yeah, that's point. right. And, yeah. But Courtright, you know, he's uh, Uncle Vernal in um, That's My Wife, which I think is his crowning moment. That's his one. I do. I love that film. But he, he's an old uh, minstrel vaudeville guy. Okay. And he's in Griffith biograph films. He started working like, in the teens for D.W. Griffith. And then he's in the, uh, some of the early Douglas Fairbanks features. He's playing smaller roles. So he has quite a long, you know, a long stage and film career. Yeah, yeah no, he's um, it certainly sticks in my mind from that to my wife. Absolutely has been stitches, that film. His, his reactions are just Oh, yeah, he's, he, he's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, he's really good. And Laura Lavarney did, you know, quite a bit for Senate, and she was in Fox comedies. And, um, you know, she doesn't have a lot to do in this but you know it's always good those people are always great when you see them duck soup leo mccary or not leo mccary because i've heard i've heard both sides of this that i think i don't think randy in his book has leo mentioned for duck soup at all but i know a lot of people thought that duck soup was leo mccary's kind of first involvement with stan and babe um Mm. and also i guess there's a marks for this link as the 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 titles but What's your take on that? Well, I'm trying to remember the timeline because I think it was in 27 that McCary became the supervising, uh, like the supervising general of the entire studio. Like he's controlling, you know, he's working on everything. He's overseeing everything. And I can't remember a time timeline wise, whether duck soup falls into that or not, whether he was supervising everything. Yeah, he was definitely at the studio because he started directing Chase in 1924. But I, th- I think in 27 is when he got moved to being the supervising general of, of like all the shorts. Um, I think this is just a little bit before that, Duck Soup. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think all he did was take the title and use it later in the Marx Brothers film. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, I think Leo, though, he was very influential in that whole studio. Um, I think people recognized pretty quickly this guy had a real vision, yeah. um, which is why Roach then appointed him to be head of the studio. 
But I think, I do think Stan had more to do with Duck Soup than Leo uh, because it was based on the sketch uh, that he had written with his father, Home from the Honeymoon, and that they had done in the halls and things. So I think that was the real source, and I think a lot of it came from that. Okay, brilliant. Uh, the the last question that I normally like to just ask um, all the guests, um, all the guests, you're only a guest number two, but uh, I will ask more in the future. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to um, to just plug that you're, you know, any projects that you're currently working on, Steve, or anything that's coming up for you? Well, just a couple of things I'd like to plug. Thanks for the the opportunity. Um, the first one you you mentioned already was. Uh, my newest book, it came out around Christmas, which is uh, Rediscovering Roscoe, the films of Fatty Arbuckle. Um, well, my main focus in this book is the films. Uh, so many of the previous books, almost all the previous writings on Arbuckle have been about the scandal and the trials. Often his career is almost sort of an afterthought, you know. In these books, they want to get to the main event, you know, to the scandal and to the trial. And then even often they, they, they'll dismiss the rest of his life in a couple of paragraphs. And, you know, from about 1913 through 1933, that's 20 years where he was working nonstop in films. Even, you know, with the, he was off screen for a year or he was not working in Hollywood for about a year or so during the trials. But once the trial was over, He's working behind the scenes constantly. He's directing and writing things. So for 20 years, he was a, you know, a very busy comedy creator. And uh, the things he directed and wrote in the 20s for people like Lupino Lane and Lloyd Hamilton and Marion Davies are, are all very, you know, really good films. So that, I think, has always been kind of lost in the shuffle, you know, in, including his own starring films for Max Sennett, too. He gets a little more attention for those, and there's the, been some really good DVD sets of those. Um, but he's never really gotten his due as a comedy creator. So my my idea was to try and examine the films and really, you know, look at those. And then my other project I'd like to uh, plug is the silent comedy watch party uh, that Ben Modell and I are doing um, every Sunday uh, at 3 p.m. New York time. Uh, where we show three shorts and, you know, present them and introduce them. And, uh, you know, we're doing this, of course, while we're all stuck inside. Um, this is an idea that Ben had had actually for quite a while, of doing some kind of live streaming program like this. But uh, this seemed like the perfect time to launch it, you know, since everybody needs something to kind of look forward to and, yeah. And to laugh at, you know, we need some laughs right Absolutely now. Absolutely do. Well, I can certainly recommend it. It is a fabulous uh, bit of time well spent on a Sunday, a Sunday evening for me, uh, 8 o'clock. I think it is isn't in uh, in UK time. But yeah, I would absolutely recommend anybody tune into that. And is, is it um, is it going well? Are, are your viewing figures, um, you know, are you happy with those? Yeah, the viewing figures are, are very good, uh, you know, because we do it live and then it's archived so you can come and watch it. But most of the episodes of had over like 2,000 views. I mean, it's Fantastic. really, and we've gotten a lot of reaction from people all over the world. We've heard from people in Argentina and Brazil and Ireland and all over, and a lot of children, you know, because parents are watching it with their kids. And a lot of cases, the kids have never been exposed to, you know, silent comedies before. And we have a lot of the adults who are saying, oh, I've never seen silent comedies before. So in, in some ways, you know, we're, we're reaching a lot of people that we didn't reach before. And I'm hoping, I know there's a lot of people who do film programming that, that say, oh, this is the end of, of public shows. You know, it was kind of happening anyway, but this could be the end. But I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think right now we might be reaching some new people that hadn't seen it before, but they seem to be so excited about the material that when the public shows start up again i think they'll be going to those as yeah, well I hope so. so i mean i think i'd like to think that a knock-on um effect from from all of this sort of lockdown is the fact that it's making people creative people come up with creative new ideas of how to get together and show films you know so you don't have to go out to, yeah. to a, a movie theater although you know i'm not saying we shouldn't but um, to, to be able to have people like you and Ben actually talk about the films before 
this is such a fabulous opportunity for us as punters, as fans, to actually get the inside knowledge, enjoy the film together, and, and some discussion as well. So I think I hope it would still continue even after you know we're we're all back out there. Well, I think our our plan is to continue it, but probably not every week. More like maybe maybe once a month or every two months, but do a, but do a regular kind of show because we have been thinking about something like this. Uh, but right now, you know, we plan to keep doing it every week as long as, uh, and what's really wonderful uh, is a lot of um, the film distributors, Kino, Lobster, uh, archives like the iFilm Museum in the Netherlands have given us permission to show some of their films. So that's, that's really wonderful. So, I mean, they're doing their bit as well, you know, to allow us to, to have access to some of this material. That's great. And that is something that has struck me that people are actually coming together at this, at this point and allowing access to, you know, to, uh, to content, which is brilliant. I hope that continues as well, but uh, yeah, we'll see. And are there any, yeah, any great. plans for Laurel and Hardy silence to be shown at the watch party? I hope so. I mean, I'm, you know, we, we're we working on May because it looks like we're going to be doing it all through May, probably through June. Um, so I would love to. I'd love to show some of their silence or even some of the solo yeah. films yeah. as well, too. Yeah. You know, there's some wonderful, you know, some of the Stan Laurel things like Mud and Sand or uh, When Nights Were Cold. This is wonderful. You know, so there's a lot of great stuff. So I definitely would like to. Yeah, because there's some. There's, sure there there seems to be, um, from an outsider's point of view, in the in the US, there seems to be a, um, a limited access to Laurel and Hardy silent films. Yeah, I think that the rights are pretty well tied up. So I know when we've shown the Laurel and Hardys, the MGM Laurel and Hardys, the late twenties stuff, uh, we always have to get permission. And the permission has kind of changed. I'm not sure exactly right now who has the permission. And the same thing with the late 20s Hal Roach stuff. We usually have to get permission as well to, you know, to show it in a commercial venue. So they're, they're a little tied up. Yeah, it's a shame. It is a shame. But uh, I guess um, they'll be all public domain within a few years anyway, won't they? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Uh, but then again, it depends whose version because someone can you know and they go to all the trouble to restore something so they'll kind of own that version so they'll still maintain a you know ownership yeah, on that yeah but but the material itself would be public yeah me. okay well um i think all that leaves me to say is uh steve thank you ever so much for joining me today and it's been lovely to talk to you and um, hopefully you'll come back again another time and chat to us again I'd love to. I mean, uh, thanks for asking me, and it was a great pleasure. It was a lot of yeah, fun. Pleasure was all ours, absolutely. Thank you ever so much, Steve. He is a great guy, isn't he? He certainly is. You know I like him. So that's it for episode two. Huge thanks again to the brilliant Steve Massa for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, and don't forget to tune in to Steve and Ben's silent comedy watch party on Sundays. Thanks as usual to all the authors who have been and continue to be so influential and important to me in my appreciation of the lives and careers of Laurel and Hardy. Although it's probably unfair to single any one out, I have to mention Randy Scretvet for his decades of research, culminating in his wonderful book, The Magic Behind the Movies. Thanks to all also at the Bohunks Orchestra for the wonderful music. And I should of course also thank Mr Laurel, Mr Hardy and Mr Roach and all the other players in Stan and Babe's lives. But most of all, thanks to all of you for listening and joining me today on this podcast journey. Please keep your comments and suggestions coming in. You can find and follow the Laurel and Hardy blog on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and also on the YouTube channel. And if you're enjoying these podcasts, please consider leaving a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, iTunes. And so all that remains is to say goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And goodbye from me. Goodbye.